suiting up an uh, ONC building in Kennedy is quite a few miles from the launch pad. Uh, they button us up uh, and it's breathing pure oxygen out of these canisters, uh, like I said, a number of hours before launch. Uh, so theoretically, denitrate our blood uh, uh, because of the pressure change. Uh, when those vehicles uh, up through Apollo, we operated with 100% oxygen and 5 psi pressure. Operationally, of course, you launch you're in one one atmosphere like in this room, and as you're going up, it bleeds the air off to get you down to five psi. And they worried about theoretically defense. I think we were all in very good shape for the trim, not like in today. I doubt if we would have got the Bennett had we not done that. But uh, that was the uh, protocol. Kind of strange going out to a the launch pad the day you launch because there's no people. Normally, if you ever go out there. Uh, had lots of times uh, earlier getting the vehicle ready. There'd be lots of people up and down the stack. And launch day, two suit techs accompanied you in that little cart that went out. And there's four people waiting at the top to help you get strapped in. And the hatch closed and make sure it's leak proof. And uh, they leave. Uh, this room uh, here is one of the firing rooms at Kennedy Space Center. Same room uh, that are being used today. Uh, to launch the launch space shuttle. It's a lot newer equipment and newer people here today. Uh, Saturn V, uh, which I know all of you up here are very familiar with, uh, was a big Hummer. Uh, the engines cranked up a little over seven seconds before liftoff. Five engines produced seven million pounds of thrust. Uh, it was not a big kick in the pants, so here you can see this motion is relatively real time. Uh, the vehicle weighed so, so heavy, it's so six million pounds of lift off. So it's not a great thrust to weight. Uh, it is continuing to burn uh, tons of oxidizer propellant, uh, RP1, is the propellant that, that vehicle. Uh, so it's getting lighter as you're going up and you feel the pressure building as you're pressing down into the couch. It gets to about four and a half G's on the first stage. Which is really, for, for all of us that flying, we've all been pilot, military pilots, fighter airplanes. So four and a half feet is not really a very big deal. Uh, fighters go six, seven feet in those days, and now the modern fighters go seven, eight feet uh, combat maneuver. Uh, and also, we land on the back of the couch, which is a nice position to take it, rather than sitting upright in the ejection seat. Booster was a little, uh, uh, rough, I'd say, is gimbling, you can feel dramatic jerking uh, as the engines gimbal to keep the steerage and uh, keep it on the right path. Uh, the most unusual thing uh, was the couches we were slung in uh, had clearance on either side. We were hung from the ceiling and it had some shock absorbing. All the things we ever had to land on land uh, to help out and survive that. And it would give you motion left and right. And that was strange compared to Emperor. I try to describe that, uh, well, most people in here are old enough to remember, like riding on the train. Going down the track and then kind of rocks you back and forth. Uh, I had trouble explaining that to the young kids. <laughs> uh, Jack here is flying it. Uh, we had left Earth orbit at this time. And the, the landing craft uh, he's aiming to there, using that target in the center you see now, uh, is the dock. And, and to extract it from the third stage, it's still sitting in the F4B. And after docking, the, the, the latches that can be uh, made, pulls the two vehicles tightly together to form an airtight seal. And then hatches can be opened either side, and you have a passageway to go between the spacecraft. You'll see that in the later. This is the Earth as we headed out away, and it really, you can see the shrinkage as you're moving out. Because initially, when you leave Earth orbit, you're headed out at about 25,000 miles an hour. So you're a flat moving out. And you get back that same speed, incidentally, when you're coming back in. Mission Control there is enjoying this uh, stage uh, show and tell TV show we had. 
Uh, we tried to bring out equipment and talk about it that we knew had not been discussed uh, previous flights. So we were going to go to bed after that, and then the next morning uh, get up and get ready to go in moon orbit and start the uh, activity leading to the landing. Uh, when the request was made to stir the cryos, uh, and we had the explosion and oxygen tank too. Uh, so this scene now is after that, the command module, the mothership, is completely shut down. You know, we've we lost oxygen, boat tanks, all of the we lost the fuel cells, and the electric power. And we had three small batteries that we had to preserve uh, for entry. So we get through entry and open the chutes and all that kind of stuff you need to get done to get home. So we went to the LAM, powered it up, uh, the landing craft, and lived off of it for the next four days. The only problem was not harmed, uh, but the, the, the problem and challenge was to make the two-day vehicle last four days, with where we were, it would take four days to get back. So that, there was a severe uh, power down, if you will. In fact, we took the LAM down to about 12 and a half amps on a 30-volt system. Convert that to watts, it's roughly two of your three-way light bulbs and the lamps at home, if you put both of them up to the third click, that's about the power consumption you live or living off of. Some extraordinary things were done. Uh, the big dishes around the world at Norway supported JPL, uh, converted a lot of, they lost a lot of sleep overnight. They converted their stations to handle our S-band uh, communications. So with those big dishes, uh, Get the signal strength, we were operating our S band with a half a watt power from the moon. So things were done like that to make sure we can still provide communication, uh, data, and uh, still uh, stay alive, keep the, keep the ECLIS environmental system running, which is still needed. Uh, this is Jet Deep Slate, and one of, one of the uh, consumables. I, I computed consumables at one point. I, I'd estimated we could go to 18 amps. And we, we, weren't, we didn't make it on water uh, on that uh, profile. The people in this control with lots of people working and got us down to 12 and a half. But I never thought of the uh, lifting hydroxide part, just, which cleaned the air of, of CO2. We're all, we humans breathe in, we use oxygen to transfer through our lungs. And we breathe out and dump it out of carbon dioxide. And the spacecraft is just like a submarine here in the planet compartment. So that carbon, that CO2 is coming enough. You don't bother doing something with it. We had, a, I guess I got to call it a, an inefficient system from the standpoint of weight. We use these lithium particles, uh, yeah, which are heavy weight and you need quite a few of them to handle that. Weight force the air pass through and they get rid of the uh, CO2. Uh, but they had to improvise to use a different shape cartridge where the command module was shut down, had a number of cartridges, an abundant supply, you didn't have enough in the lens. They were different shapes, cylindrical versus square. So there was some uh, thinking out of the box done by people uh, and uh, crew systems and uh, figure out how to use what we had on board. Make, make it all work through using our intake hose on, for one of the suits into the environmental system and put it on to force of the air to get uh, sucked through uh, the parking. This was after we separated the service module, quite a shocker. The upper section should look as shiny and as smooth as that lower part. That's where uh, the water of the spacecraft had blown off from the oxygen. Uh, Jim and Jack are at scout time. Uh, Jack's probably food in a thick beef stew. Jim has some frankfurters, uh, hot dogs, if you will. And we mostly ate, though, a uh, little cookie cube and bread cubes about that big, and we had peanuts. Uh, we gave up on the freeze dry, the powdered stuff, because it, it's not super good, even if you have hot water. <laughs> and, uh, we, we had no hot water, so we gave up on that. Uh, entry uh, turned out to be another uh, minor miracle in all of this. Uh, we had frozen this command module four days. Actually, the water tanks were frozen. 
pound frozen, he went and got on the ship. Uh, with the, and it had never been planned to be turned off the flight. Uh, in fact, the big problem was there was no book how to turn it back on. Uh, but it came through, act, we activated it, every all the systems functioned uh, well, and we had ended up with the second most accurate flight down of the program. <laughs> Only Apollo 10 had uh, a 50X, if you will, relative to the ship. We did end up also back where we originally planned, uh, south of the Samoan Islands in the Pacific. Uh, the initial plan uh, B we had was to put us in the Indian Ocean off Madagascar. And they worked uh, an alternate maneuver after we went around the moon after two hours, uh, speed up burn, if you will, at like ten hours off the return. It also put us back in the Pacific Ocean. This uh, aircraft carrier, the Iwo Jima, was placed that it had divers that they were well trained in recovery that could go in the water and safety capsule. They open the hatch when they're ready to let you out. And it was interesting when they opened the hatch, frost the cloud across the air poured out of the station, uh, even after the heat event. So there we are coming on board, a little stiff legged. Uh, even the new out flight was very short, supposed to be 12 days, ended up being six days. Uh, but even at that time, you get blood pooling after the landing in your lower extremities, which makes you feel wooden legged. Uh, so conversely, when you go up, initially in zero gravity, you have blood booming in your head. Uh, this was a three way conversation uh, with us on the ship with the President Nixon. Uh, from there, uh, I went on, uh, within a few weeks, was reassigned as backup commander on Apollo 16. At the time, I thought I would get another chance. Uh, we were we planning to then fly 18 and 19. 20 had already been canceled. Uh, I trained about five months uh, with Jerry Carr and Bill Poe, related to the Skylab. They would be, we would be the crew, and then they canceled late in the 19th. So we flew Jerry and uh, Bill. Skylab so they could get a flight. And I inherited uh, Stu Rooster and Ed Mitchell, who had just come off the 14th of the time. And we ended up filling out the uh, backup crew assignment. I, I went uh, to Harvard Business School, uh, came back and went into the Orbital of Project Office. I was interested in program management, working for Aaron Cohen at the time uh, in the early development of the uh, space shuttle. Did some support flying. Uh, in these aircrafts here, I was mainly flew the one program, which is a Japanese look-alike bow dive bomber. Uh, these aircraft were really converted by 20th Century Fox for the booby Toro Toro Toro, the attack on the Toro One day at about 300 feet, I had an engine failure, attempted to put it into a, uh, what I thought was a uh, freshly plowed dirt sod field, a dirt field. Uh, fixed the airplane, couldn't pull up the landing gear. It ended up uh, cartwheeling, uh, wing dug in, and flipped over, and ended up going upside down backwards with the canopy uh, jammed shut. And uh, cut it here to not show you some of the graphic scenes, but with, with the canopy jammed, before it could kick the panels out and get out, there were sea burns over by 65%. And then this was 1973. I uh, went into the University of Texas Hospital at Galveston for the next three months. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, another, another team effort, like a flight, uh, that was involved with a team, both airborne, obviously, but also a team larger than the movie, movie show, incidentally, uh, on the ground to work through uh, problems. And uh, there was a team here of the uh, University of Texas, uh, Galveston medical staff, attorneys, nurses, handlers, and combined with the uh, <coughs> shrine children, parents, those doctors would come and serve the adult ward next door to that hospital to do the graph, and that sort of thing. So anyway, I was in here three months. We changed the protocol uh, somewhat on the uh, graphs. Uh, I had graphs around, all around both legs. Normally, they would, when they put the graphs on, 
got to grab 